Um, thank you for coming and thanks for the opportunity uh, to, to speak and give our feedback, I suppose, on a project that uh, we have recently handed over, seems recently still, it was back in December of last year that the, the building was handed over and it's been occupied since. And thankfully as a building, it's been very well received by the, uh, the, the our direct clients and all the end users. It was very positive feedback, which is ultimately what um, we're in the game for. We were architects out and out, so we, we want to deliver high quality buildings. Um, BIM was a mechanism that we uh, saw as becoming uh, more prevalent in the industry and we wanted to make sure that we were uh, at the races really and up to speed and get our, uh, our, our workforce um, skill set up to be able to, to meet this demand. Uh, we have our first project that we utilised uh, Revit on uh, was about five and a half years ago where um, a lot of our work is spread pretty much evenly between the public sector and private sector. And we, we had a, a very strong uh, kind of grasp on a, a couple of sectors to do with the education and healthcare. And we promoted it in-house to use Revit as a means of uh, generating tender documentation and ultimately trying to improve design of the buildings and try and use it as a mechanism to, to, to leverage the 3D outputs. We started using uh, Revit within the office. We're, we're an office now, uh, just, just over 55 people. Uh, when we, we took took the kind of decision and the leap of faith, we had about 35 people in the office and we had a, a steering group within the office of about five people that went off, got up skills, uh, engaged with Arctox to get that, that process going and started a couple of pilot projects to make sure that we could take this in our stride, make sure that we could replicate the, uh, the quality of the information that we, we wanted to produce all the way through. Did this for about four or five projects where we had some engagement with uh, uh, particularly uh, structural engineers, got confident with it and when we were appointed to the, uh, the CERC project uh, we, we promoted it to the clients. They got um, appointed in early 2014 so we were relatively comfortable with our workflows and we really wanted to test level 2 BIM as a mechanism for delivering a project right through from inception. Um, to give you a very brief background on the, the project itself um, we have a, a joint client, it's a uh, University of Limerick and the HSC are uh, the joint client. It's a building that's sited on the, uh, the campus of the University Hospital in Limerick and it's a building that's going to be shared between the HSC uh, professionals, between uh, nursing staff and, and clinicians, as well as the graduate uh, entry medical students, which is a, a postgraduate programme that UL operate. So we had a joint client and upon uh, appointment we, promote, we suggested the idea that level two could be utilized for this project. It's just over 3,400 square meters, uh, capital spend budget of uh, just over 9 million. It seemed to be prime for um, just being able to, to, to uh, utilize these mechanisms. And the client was very much open to it. We had, a, 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 um, particularly in UL and HSC states, they were aware of BIM, they hadn't utilised it yet, they were keen to see what uh, leverage they could get from it and um, particularly of interest for them was to try and limit the amount of post-contract changes from a cost perspective so they they were quite quite keen for us to, to adopt it. The, the rest of the design team were subsequently appointed under the proviso that it was going to be level 2 BIM and JV Tierney's and MOG consulting engineers uh, were appointed as the, uh, on the design team with the Edward Cotter partners. So the project overview, and I've touched on a lot of it there, the design team appointments. So what I'll go through really is just the design stages, the tender production stages, what we've, uh, what we've went through, and uh, the procurement and contractor um, appointment. This is obviously a point of, uh, of concern for the client, um, not just because of the uh, making sure we weren't setting any targets that were too high. Uh, it's a regional market sector that wasn't going to be the same uh, Kind of depth of experiences may well have been in, in, in the double market at the time so there was a little bit of anxiousness there but we were able to, to negotiate and, and navigate our way through that and then really what we set out as requirements and our experience from the construction stage and the and the fm stage because thankfully we have a successful completion of the project as i said the design stage the objectives we just wanted to improve the design uh, development we wanted to try and make sure that we could uh, harness the, the 3d benefits from our point of view, from an internal perspective, to, to get better quality buildings and make sure that we, we, we understood it ourselves before actually selling it with confidence to, uh, to a client. The client body, given that it was HSE and UL, 
and there was multiple stakeholders. We were, it was clear from the brief with the different departments that were there. There's, uh, the building itself has um, a lecture theatre of about 100, it's 140 capacity. There's a series of tutorial rooms. Uh, there's a library with a, a series of support accommodations to that that's shared amongst different users. There's uh, cellular offices, open plan offices that are used by uh, consultants, clinicians, director of nursing. All of these multiple stakeholders are all sharing in this building. And then there's uh, uh, a research level as well, which is uh, a dedicated area. It was clear to us that the client engagement was going to demand us to have a clear steering group from, from the University of Limerick and from the HSE. But it was going to really, the success of the delivery of it and the ultimate the, the completion of it, was going to need engagement with multiple stakeholders. So we wanted to make sure that, that process was as linear as possible without having to revisit and have this iterative process that can sometimes become the case with particularly uh, uh, end users that might not be familiar with, with reading plans. So that was something that we wanted to leverage. The re resolving of clashes prior to tender, we hadn't had the opportunity up until this project to, act, uh, to implement the full integration of um, MEP models and services design. Like we're skilled architects in what we do, but a lot of it was, oh, we've got a pinch point with a dense down beam, how do we resolve this? What's the size of the duct? How can we do that? What's the impact on ceiling height? And a lot of it is, is, is using our, our own kind of judgment with the design team to target areas that we think are pinch points. The kind of the, the, the thoroughness of that can vary uh, uh, as resource demands and we wanted to make sure that we could leverage the uh, uh, Revit and, and BIM to, to, to help that process. And the quality of the tender documentation, um, like with, this was a public works contract, um, the amount of uh, adjustments on site or changes on site and coordination on site, that just generates questions, it generates conversations that need to be had between site agents and, and site engineers with, uh, with the design team and ultimately then it gets into the realms of, of quantities of errors and then generates that discussion and it's, it's trying to make sure that we could improve the quality of the, the tender information to try and reduce that level of conversations so we could actually do what we want to do which is build a good quality building. The guidance that was adopted as level 92 was the, uh, was the obvious thing to, to use. We, and EIR was something that was absent from our briefing and we, it was, we had mentioned it to the, the client at the outset that we needed to make sure with PAS 1192 the role of the information manager needs to be uh, uh, rec uh, recognised, represented at the, uh, within the design team and make sure that we had an EIR that would underpin everything from that point on. Uh, we had promote, pr promoted this, this idea to them, they were happy to do it and we engaged with, uh, with Arctox to, to to guide that, um, that process to get that AOER written and in place. And um, thankfully that was all quite straightforward and it just really set the, the, the touchstone for, for the project all the way through. We set up, set up the basis that there'd be an information manager during design stage. Each uh, uh, design team member had a BIM coordinator that uh, liaised on a, a weekly uh, basis uh, with model uploads on a, a fortnightly basis. So that kind of regime kicked in quite, quite quickly. We had really good engagement with the uh, with the design team, with Joe Gutierrez and MRG. They were really uh, there was full engagement on uh, across all parties. We're trying to make sure that we could see, okay, if everybody gives this a, a focus, how, what can we uh, benefit from it? We got the um, design stage BIM execution plan in in place, and I think it's worth saying that the the RAI template that if that does exist is, is is pretty good. I don't think this is out of reach to, to for people to just implement. And that role of information manager was to transfer across to the, the contractor at uh, tender stage. So to give you a little bit of sight of the project itself, the red line is the overall campus of the um, University Hospital in Limerick. The blue uh, bu uh, bubble in the center of it is the site that we were given for the clinical education research building. It is sandwiched in between physiotherapy and uh, uh, there's a recently completed emergency uh, department down there and the oncology unit, so it's bound on, on all sides. And actually to the south of that, there's been, since this area photo was taken, there's... Uh, okay. So the, the, the site being at this point, the outpatient department, emerging care, the main hospital street, and this area has since been covered with uh, public and, and staff car parking. Now, the site at the moment, uh, as we uh, took it on, was an area that was used for just surface car parking. 
building for urgent care and outpatients have since been built with uh, underground car parking. This car parking was relocated as part of an enabling works. And that site itself was identified within the development control plan for the University Hospital, where there was block diagrams and there was a, a zone left for a, a future maternity hospital. And our building had this footprint and the existing road with the blue dotted line goes around here and the future plan is for that road to be re-diverted. And what we wanted to do within the, the plan was to show to the client what the impact, not just of, of uh, our building would be, but also how it impacts on the wider development control plan. And by the, the site has uh, some contouring towards the site, uh, to the side. There's about a six and a half, seven meter level difference between there and there. The hospital street that runs along and the hospital planning level access is, is paramount to just adjacencies. So level zero, one, two, three, they were all very much established and ingrained within uh, the, the hospital. And what, what we were able to utilize just using basic uh, mass modeling and topless surfaces was by the time we put in the uh, clinical education building, which was emanating into the, uh, a four story building at this, uh, at this point, with showing how the connections would be, but showing the impact on the topography around there, and there was going to be need for quite a significant amount of, um, of, of piling uh, because of the level difference uh, at this point. The client really had adopted a development control plan, was implementing and, uh, uh, and developing uh, projects to it, but this really resonated with them. They got a, a better understanding, and it's, it's, it's really the, the first uh, sign that we saw. This was kind of week three or four on the project, and we were able to show them the benefits of having 3D uh, 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 graphics. And we were able to show them then the kind of fo footprint of the future maternity hospital and the demands that that would put on the topography around there. So it, it really does, does help uh, uh, illustrate all of that. Part of our brief was to design the building to allow for a two-story uh, future expansion as well, which really just um, copper fastened the benefit of making sure that the, the Revit model and the AIM that we, we future develop and the, uh, the FM side of it would allow for that ease of uh, future, uh, future expansion and extension. So the site, as we see, is that the existing roadway. So it's a, um, a, an orbital route around. There's a, a very quiet entrance in from the, the public car park and people come down through a set of steps and ramps, and that's the door. It's pretty quiet, and it's something that was uh, part of the brief to improve upon. You can see the level of embankment there to an area that is uh, landfill used for uh, surface car parking. So the design that we developed was to just put a more appropriate front door to that, um, uh, that approach for the, the public car parking. And also to have from that link into the hospital street uh, and access into the clinical education and uh, research centre. You can see the, the, the form of the, the building. Uh, we purposely struck a line at the, uh, just above two storeys because of the topography of the ground. We wanted it to create a datum. Uh, that would just give the, the, the building a, a little bit of grounding within it. It's limestone to the uh, to the base with um, rain screen, fiber cement cladding to the upper levels. And uh, the reason for the limestone, it has a sister building in the University of Limerick that Grafton Architects completed uh, about two years before, which is, is clad entirely in limestone. Um, a fabulous building, and they wanted to make sure that this building, which is effectively the, the, the campus, the hospital campus located building, had a, a, a twinning and a, um, a, a similarity in its architectural approach. And um, because the, the way the model of, of learning happens, the first couple of years, there's a, a largely um, desk based, lecture room based on campus where it's heavy uh, in books. And then there is the need for there to be an on site with the hospital uh, adjacency so that um, the um, medical students have access to live wards and consultants can actually come in, deliver lectures and have their own uh, workspaces directly associated with where patients are. We were able to then also be, uh, show what the future expansion would be. Our brief didn't know what was going to be in this, this shell, we just knew there was going to be need for uh, expansion of a, a, a square meterage. And very straightforwardly utilizing uh, Revit again, we were able to show that that could be extended on, but also show how a hospital entrance may well develop into something when, particularly when the maternity hospital uh, becomes uh, on stream. The plans 
and 2D outputs were all generated uh, from, from the uh, Revit model and they were quite straightforward and we were keen from the early stages to make sure that when we took the decision to, to go for Revit that all of our documentation would be as clear and legible uh, as we were, had become in, in, in PAD. And we were, the, one of the really very useful benefits was the outputs from Revit at those stages to be able to show so many diagrams without, and a very real uh, accurate area calcs for rooms that we were able to have meaningful discussions with the client and what size is that room and without the labour of polylines and hatch and everything that had become something that we just took in our stride in, in CAS, that, that process was just eased out, no, no end. So it's a really extremely positive uh, uh, benefit of, of utilising Revit from our point of view. To give you a description of the, uh, the building very quickly, a link entrance into the hospital street, an entrance foyer into the CERC building, uh, a broadening in the circulation outside the lecture theatre, toilets adjacent to it, and then through into the, the student areas with lockers, student common area, tutorial rooms, plant uh, tutorial rooms at this point. There's an accommodation stair that leads up into a, 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 a empty space, into the library, into the reading room, collaborative study area, some cellular offices for library staff, book collections and computer lab, and up again a stair that leads you through into uh, a clinical area for teaching, more tutorial rooms, uh, uh, tutors offices and consultants offices, administration, open plan offices, meeting rooms, and then there's a research level with the lab, a couple of meeting rooms, and the uh, consultants uh, rooms. And the building itself, uh, we're, thankfully, we were able to deliver it that was pretty faithful to 3D renders of, of what we were producing. Um, like 3D renders have, have become expected from, from clients, and instead of what we had been doing, outsourcing, uh, CAD models, or using SketchUp to uh, a certain degree, just being able to in-house late on a, uh, a Wednesday night before a client meeting to be able to, to, to render for the cloud and get something that was, was helpful to, uh, to, to sell a design idea to a client. It just helped that decision-making process and it meant we didn't have to read, I'm not sure what you mean there or, or, or whatever it might be, but also that the cost of having to outsource that, that rendering. Is there. The user engagement that I mentioned earlier on um, we had a series of different mechanisms for, for doing this. We had a steering group that were effectively the decision makers, but ultimately they'd only be comfortable making the decision if they had faith in the, the design that we were putting in front of them. The multiple uh, end users, huge engagement needed with them to make sure that the building was a success. And we had town hall meetings and we had round what, the table meetings with them. There was up to uh, 60 or 70 end users engaged and it was, it was in different, different mechanisms. But by being able to give them renders with a small bit of Photoshop of people uh, into the, uh, to these discussions, they straight away just got it. They understood what the design intent was going to be and we were able to then take uh, just section boxes from the, the Revit model to show them the extent of modeling. And you can see all of the, the cable um, uh, trunking, trunking data plates. This is a video conferencing suite. All of that was able to be modeled. So you had the IT technicians just got it, they understood it but also then we're able to show the tutors and uh, clinicians the, the mechanisms. Um, <coughs> this uh, staff uh, tea breakout areas, this is just before completion, and then the lecture theatre again, showing very basic uh, Revit renders, Revit section boxes, and then <coughs> the completed. And my lessons learned from some of these, and from our point of view, we were able to just catch on a visual inspection, things like, you can see there, um, fire extinguishers, and they're set at a level of 750 above floor level but to the wrong floor level. So we were able to catch these kind of things and make sure that it was, it was, it was caught. Um, the library then, just basic renders, and they are really quite basic, but again, it, 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 the, the design of this did more. We've got a, an image from just before the, uh, the fit-out has happened, but it just was able to get buy-in and confidence with the, with the clients and get decisions to be able to uh, be made and progress. An open plan office is a pretty contentious issue where the height of these desks can never be high enough for some and never be low enough for others that, that allowed that discussion to happen. And we then were able to go back to the steering group and uh, present um, renders of the building with precedent images to be able to get sign off on materials. And again, when you have a contractor that needs to have certainty of procurement and uh, it just, those decisions can't, uh, can't delay. 
So these images again, very straightforward uh, renders with people added. That's the only thing that was added to any of these, which um, is great to have within Reach. Now the tender documentation, um, as, like we, we pretty slavishly followed PAS 1192 all the way through. So the, uh, we isolated and distilled down the requirements for the contractors uh, into what we call a works requirement report. And we have that sets out everything from uh, the project details to the site, site constraints, the site rules, health and safety management regime. So it, it sets out the, um, the expectations uh, from our point of view as an EOR. Um, as part of that, we included the expectations for, uh, for BIM. We just, uh, distilled it down into two pages because the, this was early 2015, late 2014, that these tender documents were being issued. So the level of uh, maturity and understanding in the industry was, was a concern that we weren't going to spook uh, contractors of an uh, appropriate scale to, uh, away from this project. So we wanted to uh, distill that down. We did include everything from an EIR uh, to the model production delivery table, and we put in the scope of services for the information manager, what was going to be expected. We put in the, the, um, the PDMS and the digital safety file requirements. It was the requirement for the, the contractor to propose a common data environment that we used during the course of the project. We had used Autodesk 360 as a design team for that collaboration through the design stages. So we were looking for, as part of the tender returns, proposals from the contractor, what they were intending to use so that we could have sight of that and understanding of it. It wasn't a qualitative assessment, we just wanted to have an understanding uh, uh, of that. And there was the uh, requirement for the as-built BIM model, the uh, asset information model, that wasn't just for geometric accuracy for the future development, mm -hmm but also the um, safety file interface. We wanted to make sure that there was a 3D interface so that the client had the uh, flexibility to be able to utilize that for, for FM purposes. The, as part of the, the tender period, uh, it was flagged in the SAQ to, to tenders that, that level two was going to be uh, utilized. We held um, uh, pre-tender, uh, pre it was during the, the, the course of the tender uh, uh, um, period in the first couple of weeks we had an information meeting where we effectively gave a presentation of the expectation and tried to demystify what we were going to be um, requiring of the contractor to, to bid on because we needed to make sure there was an understanding of it, there wasn't going to be a, a misrepresentation of what we were looking for and that a lot of these documents really was just going to inform their, their, their workflow. Now the services and uh, structure coordination is really that was the big game changer from the design team's point of view at design stage. If there was a, a relatively um, uh, complex uh, servicing uh, need for the building because of the nature of it with uh, high occupancy rooms like the lecture theatre and even the library which needs to maintain a, a, a comfort level uh, within it. So there was an, an amount of, um, of air handling and, and mechanical ventilation around it. And the structure itself because of the design intent that we wanted for clear spans, it demanded for um, precast double T uh, slab units, which have a kind of bespoke nature mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to them, and all of those red beams just show that, that downscan profile. So the integration of that, that forced the design team to just deal with it and design it properly. And that's, I think, a very healthy thing to, uh, to, to force those questions at design stage, because it, it just isn't something that should be done uh, while you're on site with a, a tender and our construction program ticking. So it forced them that, those questions to happen. And there's no doubt, I think, we, we uh, leveraged the, the benefits of that. I uh, won't say well, it wasn't without pain. It certainly certainly did have its, its moments. And it forced things like making sure that air diffusers were tight to ceiling planes. And it forced the, us to really recognize, and as much as architects might say, oh, I want a ceiling height higher, you need to accommodate service to us. And we were able to be forced to just say, okay, we're going to compromise uh, ceiling heights in a certain portion of a room and have to avail of it elsewhere. So there was no changes on site that we weren't aware of. There was like every single project I think I've been on, there's been at least a plethora of access hatches that we weren't expecting because a, a contractor has come on and says, actually, I need access there, 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 and there because of the damper. You put them in, or there might be that clamor of, oh, oh no, we have to get the ceiling height down from the 2.7 that's in the brief to 2.4. And we never really like any of those kind of decisions to be made on site. They compromise the quality in our mind. If 
we were able to, to get those decisions made at design stage, make our peace with them, move on, and it really did, uh, we didn't have any of those clangers on site. But you can see services, soils and vents were all, uh, so soils and waste were all modeled in. Uh, see if this is a kind of flagged smoke head, which is meant to be up here, it was thrown into the room, needs to be put up, all of those <coughs> things. It's great to have them flagged at design stage so that there's no uh, changes that we weren't aware of on site. Uh, sorry, I've clicked onto a different presentation. <sighs> Um, but ultimately, the tender documents that were, were produced, the 2D information with the contract information and the, uh, the tender documents. So room layouts were traditional room layouts. Um, GAs were traditional GAs. The, the model that was produced, there was a, a separate ME, or MEP, structural and architectural models, all produced using Revit. Uh, they were all um, made available to the successful uh, contractor. There was an IFC file, an NWD file issued as for information at tender stage to allow the contractor uh, get an understanding of it, develop up uh, um, their, their program, the 4D program was a deliverable <coughs> for the, the tender documents. Um, details were all developed and, and basically the, the um, call-outs from the Revit model were, were developed. This is something that, from our takeaway from this project, these notes that were connected back into the MBS building, that's something that we feel should be improved upon because it, it isn't enough information for, for construction and it isn't as much information as we, we would have produced for uh, our detailed information at, with 2D and CAD. So the, the construction stage and the site, uh, the objectives of that, we wanted to reduce the amount of site changes, we wanted to make sure that we protect the, the, the quality of the building first and foremost, but also to make sure that the post-contract changes didn't generate those conversations between site agents and ultimately to QSs <coughs> and then conversations with clients about 10-3 uh, changes and cost changes. We just wanted to try and mitigate and reduce that as much as we, we could. And the early identification of issues, it's really that's exactly what it is. We want to make sure that there, nothing becomes a problem for the, uh, the, for the procurement and for the construction of the, um, for the project. The improvement of the construction team's project understanding. Like there's multiple stakeholders and there's, multi there's buy-in needed from every, uh, every stakeholder in the project. And using <laughs> Revit and having 3Ds, you're able to sit down with anybody from like the site agent who's heavily involved to the uh, to the operatives having uh, just an awareness of what the, the goal is. The, the site coordination again, making sure that the, 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 the quality is is maintained and making sure that things can be planned, procurement is planned, and, and sequencing is planned in a, in a way. And the, ultimately, we wanted to make sure that we had the data rich aspect model for the client. The, the role of an information manager passed across at tender stage to the contractor, in line with Supplies 1192. There was a requirement for the, um, uh, the contractors to develop up the BIM execution plan, as I mentioned, the OREO template is absolutely adequate for that. And there was the need for the common data environment to manage the information. It just, again, having that single source of truth so, so that you could make sure that everybody is, uh, is signed up and, and using the, 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 the right information. Um, the BIM coordination meetings, and I won't uh, labour on this too, too much with, uh, with CISC about to, to speak about it, like they, they were prepped, ready for coordination meetings, and decisions were able to be made on, okay, we've got an issue here where there's a, a duct coming through, how are we going to resolve it? And it just by graphically showing them, having the Revit model be able to, to, to generate the, um, the agenda for these meetings, they were really the most productive coordination meetings that on any project I've been involved in because there was no, oh, there's that issue that we've been, de been dealing with for two or three or four meetings. They just get dealt with and there was decisions made and you have informed people in the room to be able to, to, to move and get on and it flags things like we've exposed pipes, oh, we don't like where they are, can we route them into the riser? Of course you can and whatever it might be. It was just it was very, very um, fruitful and it, it fostered a very um, healthy working relationship between the design team and the uh, contractor. And it, like, it really was quite a, um, quite a, um, a healthy uh, relationship. Things like coordination of floor pedestals for raised, raised access floors, like, it just flags these issues so that when the ductwork arrives on site, you know what to, to expect. And there, there was a, a, a seamless thing. And again, uh, Killian and Enzo will talk about the fact that designed information was produced into uh, realized uh, buildings. So the, the, the key issues from our point of view, like the, the brief is underpins 
So we, we had the benefit of a, a, a client who had willing from the outset to engage with level two as a, as, as a, a process. We guided them along, along that, um, but making sure that we understood what their objectives were, what were they going to um, benefit from and utilize from level two. In this instance, they wanted to test it because the HSE had problems with projects post-contract design changes, the cost changes that emanate from those, how can this be utilized to leverage that? There was the added benefit of making sure that the, um, the building was able to be developed in a seamless manner for the, the, the upper floors. So that as a kind of a mandate was pretty clear to us. And um, we delivered it uh, because they're in comparison to similar scale projects of similar complexity that this, as I said, is about uh, 9 million. Um, like the, the number of 10 threes that were generated on this project was about a quarter to the a relative project that we've we worked with an equally competent contractor and the number of the, the cost changes that emanate that were, were also uh, reduced because of it. But that redu reduction in 10 threes from our point of view is just, it's, it's a healthier collaborative working environment, but it also means you're not wasting your time with QS is talking about things that doesn't actually improve the built product, which is again, what we're, what our, our, our aim is the design to, to tender, like the, the coordination aspects that feeds hand in glove into the other. The real takeaway for us is to make sure that we have enough resource front loaded into the, the design to tender because it took longer to do design to tender. It took us about two months longer to get the information uh, complete, ready for issue for, for tender relative to um, a similar project. Now, I still think that's time well spent because it did uh, help the construction stage. But in terms of um, our management of clients' expectations, if they come in and say, oh, we need to be out to tender by November, you can, we, we now know that we need to allow, if it's level two then, we need to allow extra time and we need to just, uh, just ease that, that, that program uh, uh, expectation from, from clients' point of view. And the de-risking construction stage, I've, I've touched on enough of that. We, the construction stage itself, like making sure that it's capable contractors is, is the, and I think the, the industry is, is mature and we're seeing level two uh, being, like the, uh, being more and more understood, more and more um, sought after by not just clients, but contractors. I think, I think there is an appetite there to, to engage with it. Um, the construction stage itself, we had the ongoing use of monitoring. We, like, Sounds like a bit of a heavy stick, but we, we, we wanted to make sure that we had sight of an updated model every two weeks. That was the only way we could see it being a mechanism of, of having a contractor actually use it and engage it. That mechanism wasn't the real way because we knew the guys were, were using it, we were at coordination meetings with them. Um, but the technical submittals and the coordination of those, that's really where the benefit was, where um, m and &E, precast subcontractors, um, stair balustrades, stair flights, all of those key interface uh, uh, subcontractors, making sure that the, the technical submittals have gone through the process of that um, uh, coordination. That really was the, the big uh, uh, was driver for it all. And the, the FM, from the client side of things, we needed to understand, first of all, what are the, the, the asset registers that they want to make sure are embedded within the model. There was a requirement for, for Kobe to be put in and the, and the classification to be added during the construction stage. In truth, the, 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 the maintenance of the, um, of the building is going to require just maintainable assets and the client was, had engagement, there was proposals brought forward, Zootech are going to speak about that, through, um, through CISC, met with, the, uh, with HSE and, the, and UL uh, to actually demonstrate the benefits of it. And that will, that will is something that is now going to be just taken on and, and developed. Um, but it's making sure that the, the client's engagement in that process is, is uh, brought forward as early as possible because really the, our, our immediate client interface are not the ones that are going to be worrying about the maintenance of the building. I think that engagement with those, the maintenance personnel uh, really um, is, is key. So the, the completed building, as I mentioned, it's limestone to the, uh, uh, to the base with fibre cement cladding to, uh, to the upper levels. A four-story building with the future expansion uh, expected, and you can see the road uh, geometry as it, as it climbs up around. Uh, see the grass, see the roof over the, pro the projection for the uh, lecture theatre. And the, the, the building form itself is kept uh, relatively straightforward. And it sits into an ever-evolving uh, UHL campus.
but the internal spaces and um, are being really well received from the clients. Um, daylight analysis and overheat and all of that was gone through with, uh, with JV Chains and JVTE during the design stages. So it's uh, quite a very comfortable building to, to go into. And it, again, approach to interiors, like we were able to just utilize uh, Revit for, for all of that. Um, so that's where I'll step away.